Welcome to Handle the Daily, where men who are husbands, dads, and entrepreneurs come together to conquer the day. This is more than just a podcast, it's a movement. Here we pursue the Lord, lead our families, and build the kingdom. If you're seeking conversations that delve deep, reveal truth, bring honor, and challenge you to become the man of God you know you can be, then you're in the right place. Join us as we journey together, setting our sights on legacy, forging ahead to build a better tomorrow. Welcome to Handle the Daily, where we conquer the day together to build legacy for tomorrow. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Handle the Daily, and this is our Friday episode. And today I've got Stuart on, and we're going to be talking about fatherlessness. Stuart, man, thank you for being on. Yeah, man. And, and and you're also part of something else too that is very similar to what Handle the Daily is. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinetic man and then lead us in a prayer and we'll get going on the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, so the kinetic man is uh it, it first um started as a podcast. Uh the original podcast we actually started was called Filling the Storehouse. It was more in line with our our real estate businesses, but uh from my last episode in the journey of really kind of figuring out what what uh what life was all about and purpose and mission and identity, uh we we kind of changed our focus and the kinetic man is uh the podcast and then we also run a a men's group a christian men's group um primarily i'd say for military veterans but it is open to to other men that are not a military veteran um and uh, it's it's an opportunity for men to get together uh we have two different groups one meets weekly uh, all over zoom uh virtual and then we do in person retreats as well um but it's a chance to just get together and, and really um, hold each other accountable to being better men, to being better husbands, to being better fathers, to being better friends and, and leaders in the community um, and show up uh, as men um, and be different than what society says men should be doing. Come on. That's awesome. How can someone be part of the uh, Zoom weekly prayer piece? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have a website called thekineticman.com. Um, you can go right there and there's a sign up link. Um, we are, uh, opening only the, uh, so we have a monthly call. So we have a monthly call. that's just once a month, it's the first Friday of every month. And that's just kind of a, a wave tops view of, of this 80 page, uh, curriculum document that we came up with that dives deep into, um, you know, the, the priorities in our life. And, uh, you, you get introduced to it, you join the, the monthly calls. And then once you're in that for a little bit, uh, you can then join, uh, you know, the kind of the inner circle, we don't really call it that, but the, the full blown mastermind that then we meets on a, on a weekly basis. So you get introduced to the concepts through our monthly call. And then if you want to go deeper then you can join us for the weekly call, but that's all um, sign up on, on the, the kinetic man.com. Awesome. We'll make sure to plug that in. Yeah. Thanks man. So you want to lead us in a little bit of a prayer? Let's do it. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, allowing us to have a conversation uh, around fathers. Uh, Mm -hmm. you are, you are the guiding light for, for us, uh, the ultimate father, uh, allow us to walk in your footsteps, to follow your lead, to allow us to be more present, to be more intentional, to lead our families. Well, just like you lead us. We love you. You know, we pray. Amen. Amen. So fatherlessness so that means there's no dads in the house, right? Well, a lot of times there's not. Right? A lot of times there's not. Um, I, you know, I'm going to butcher this stat, but uh, the last time I checked, I think that they said that one in four families in the U.S., uh, kids are living uh, with a fatherless, with you know, without a father in the home. One in four families. 25% of kids have no father figure in their life. That's pretty ridiculous. That's pretty ridiculous. Um, but that doesn't even include, uh, you know, stepfathers or um, fathers that are there that, but really aren't even present because right. they're so wrapped up in their identity of their jobs and their careers and their work. Um, 
yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a real issue. And I think it's having a major impact on our children and has a major impact on the world, honestly. Yeah. What I've, what I've seen is there's an increase in men that are boys. Yeah. And men that are still doing video games and wanting to have a mom and not a wife. That's right. And I think a lot of this comes from that fatherlessness from either a dad not being there or a dad being there, but not emotionally and mentally being there, just physically being there. And when you don't have that father influence in the life of the, Hey, look, I want to see you succeed, but I know you have to fail in order to make it through. And I'm, I've got kids from seven to 21 mm. and the older two are, um, stepsons, 17 and 21. And then I have a daughter who's 17, but then my younger two are boys and they're seven and 10. And how I am with the seven and 10 year olds is very different than how I am with the two 17 year olds and 21 year old. And I try not to be like a stepdad to my stepsons. One of my friends, he calls them bonus babies. But I think if uh, <laughs> I heard me call them bonus babies, but I, I just tell them like, look, I'm not here to replace your dad, but I am going to love you like it. you're my own. And I'm going to yeah. be like a dad. And, you know, the 17 year old, his name's Josh. And just seeing like he and I went out to dinner last night and he's, he's a pretty quiet reserved kid, but We've been now in relationship. I've known his mom for two years now, and we've been married almost a year and a half. And just, it's it's a consistency that has had to happen. And it's only been really in the last maybe 60, 90 days that I've seen our relationship between Josh and I really start to blossom. And it has everything to do with being present, being intentional, and just looking at him as how unique God made him and not trying to say, Hey, you're me just in a different look and ask him questions. And man, it's been, I'll, I'll have to say like, that's actually been one of the most rewarding things I've had really recently happen is just seeing that depth of connection that he and I have and to be able to go out and laugh and have fun and joke around and talk creatively and, ask questions that are hard questions and talk about what's going on in the world and, and just hearing, hearing what, how he thinks and how he sees it's, it's been pretty phenomenal. Yeah, man. And it dude, like men are missing out on being dads. hundred percent, hundred percent. It breaks was... my heart. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, from the last episode, I, I, ex I experienced quite a bit myself of not having a dad Yeah, and, um, you know, my, my, I don't want to say not have a dad. My dad was, he was around, he was around kinda. Um, my stepdad was around kinda, but like they weren't all in, they weren't, they weren't all in. Like when it got hard, my real dad left and my stepdad, like he just wasn't really emotionally there and it had an impact on me and I'm finding this out at like age 40, right? Like there's, right. there's some impact to that. Um, thankfully I've, my, my mother is amazing. Um, you know, and, and she did the single mom thing for years, which I don't even know how they do. Cause I got two young kids and I don't even know how I would do that as a, as a single parent. Um, it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. And you know, but. I have amazing friends. I have an amazing wife and, um, it, it does take intentionality. It does require you to, to put some of the other stuff on hold at times, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. I, uh, I was sitting with, uh, it's, it's yearbook. It's end of school year. It's yearbook time. My kids, yep. you know, get, got their yearbook yesterday and we were going through it last night um, you know, reading all the kids' comments, looking at pictures. And it's pretty cool. In the back of my kids' yearbook, there's a section that's titled All About Future Me. Mm. And and there's some questions with some blank space that, the, you know, the kids can kind of fill in. And it's it's questions like, um, well, what are you going to do when you grow up? Like, 
what, what's your career going to be? Where are you going to live? What are you going to drive? What are your hobbies going to be? What are your goals? And my son, he's six. The answers to his questions, they were me. Mm. What does he want to do when he grows up? He wants to work at Storehouse. Storehouse is our real estate company. Come on, man. What does he want? To, where does he want to live? He wants to live in Parker, Colorado. Where does he want to drive? He wants to drive a Chevy Silverado. This one got me teared up. What are your hobbies? Playing with my kids. Woo. What are my goals? <laughs> this one made me laugh. Be nice to my sister. <laughs> he still has some work to do in that department. <laughs> but I... I would have filled that out differently at six. Yeah. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have been my dad. Why? Because he wasn't there. You didn't know who he was. Didn't know who he was. He lived in a different state. I saw him for a month at a time in the summer. And when I did see him, he was just working. I would go to his office and like sit and hang out. And he, he ran a, he was a small business owner. He ran a furniture manufacturing company. That's all I did was work all the time, all day. I love him. I don't fault him. And if he listens to this, I, you know, again, I love him and I don't fault him, but like there was, there was some impact there. There was some impact there. Um, yeah, I, I can relate. I had a, my dad passed when I was 29 and my dad worked very hard. He worked for DOD and he also had his own side consulting business that he did work for other departments of the government. And if I wanted to see my dad, I had to get up early and I had to stay up late. And then if I wanted to spend a lot of time with him, I had to go travel with him. Yeah. And I remember I was probably four and my dad was typical blue jeans, white button down, tucked in, black belt, black uh, penny loafers. And I dressed just like my dad when my dad was home. I did the blue jeans. I did the white button down. And you remember back in the 80s, they had like the really crazy stitch on the pockets. Yeah. Yeah. I had those Jordache jeans or whatever the heck they call. But like. It's a rad. Right. I wanted to be like my dad. And I remember it was finally whenever he, so it got to like 2006, so two years before he passed, before we really started to finally get to know each other. And that's when he was starting to slow down and he was starting to realize what it was me at 27 had to offer him. And so we were actually going to launch a business together working on government uh, projects doing video and animation work for the government and we were going to do that because he had all the all the connections and then all of a sudden he died he had cancer mm -hmm. and I spent two years feeling like I was robbed because it took 27 years of my life to get to a point where I actually was starting to know my dad and then he passed before I could even ask him the questions that now I have the questions and now he's not here. And I'm like, dang, dad, come on. And, it's and, tough. and, and having, having my dad at home, but not having him around. And, and I mean, my mom, like, I remember whenever he started actually being around more, my mom's like, get out of here. Because it ruined her flow of what she was doing. Yeah. And because there was a lack of him being around, there was a lack of relationship that he had with my mom and they didn't have that closeness. And I highly doubt they had any intimacy as well that really brought them even tighter together. And seeing where we are now as a society, like you can tell that there's such a massive amount of division in what a father should be, what a father can't be, and I mean, you've got women that 
I, I think if we went back and we were listening, if we talked to the women on the view, not one of them would say a, a man is needed in their life. Nope. And I think if we asked your wife, she would say, yeah, I need Stuart. I need my husband. I need the father of my kids. There's a, there's a really, really good book. There's two, two great books somewhat on this topic. Um, we, we recently had the author of, um, uh, book is titled of boys and men mm. by Richard Reeves. We had him on our show a couple of weeks ago and men are failing right now. Yep. And there is a ton of data to prove it. And the, the, the white male, um, in, in, you know, middle to higher class society cultures, uh, in America probably don't see it. Um, but there is a real, um, challenge going on with men. And, and again, there's, there's, there's specific data to show it. And it, and it kind of all started and and this is like the the women's movement back mm -hmm. in the seventies is great. It's fantastic, right? Like it needed to happen. Um because women are more than just the stay at home mom, right? They they do have an amazing ability to be entrepreneurs, business women, mm -hmm. um, startup entrepreneur, you know, like uh in the business world and but they have taken on those roles, but then also still lean in on the roles of the mom, of, uh, the, the wife of, uh, the, you know, this, the cooker, the cleaner, the, the emotional support of children. Like the, she fills all those roles and does it well. Um, they're going to college. There's way more women graduating from college now than men. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse from that gap perspective of, of women going in to the workforce, into gra college graduation, MBAs, like all these, um, education sources, the men are dropping off because they still only see themselves in the role of the provider, the worker, the money maker, and they don't see themselves in any other role in society. And a lot of the work that is now coming online, like, you know, AI and robotics, all this stuff is, is replacing a lot of the work that men do. Yep. And the work that is growing is education and, uh, health. And, um, those aren't typical roles that men would go into in the workforce. Well, and, and it's, so, it's like what you guys were talking about. Men suck at having friends. Mm. Men and, suck at and, having friends. And, and, and I think that's another piece that plays into the fatherlessness because when you have a man who's isolated, he doesn't have friends, he doesn't have the connection with his wife and he doesn't have the connection with his kids, it's easier to stay in the background saying, well, I justify my existence by being that provider, but then their whole identity comes from the one thing that they do. And then like what you're talking about with AI, like, I use 12 different AI platforms, so I don't have to hire a whole large team. Yeah. And, and then I started thinking, I was like, dang, man, I should actually start hiring actual people with a heartbeat to do mm -hmm. some of these pieces, even though I can save a ton of money. But there's something in there that's beyond just that transaction side. There's a relationship piece. And having, having those relationships by men having the friends, by having the relationship with their wife, by having the relationship with their kids, they can walk in a more fullness. And then everybody else, there's this reciprocal ripple effect that goes back and forth and, and it just lifts everybody. And, and here's the deal. I mean, men, men need, uh, they need, they need metrics. They need, they need uh, something to tell them that they're doing good. Right. And you can get that in your work. You can get that in your career. You have your, your KPIs, your key performance indicators. You have your, your sales, you have your, the, the income, you have the, the number of reach outs, the number of meetings, like whatever your indicator is for success in work. And, and like, you have that to like 
tell yourself that you're doing good. You don't have that at home. No. You don't have a key performance indicator on how your relationship is with your wife. You don't, you don't have a statistic that tells you that you have a good relationship with your kid, that your kid wants to be like you when you get older. Like you don't have that. It's a lot harder to have a really good loving relationship with your kids because humans are difficult. They're challenging. And especially when they're little. Especially when they're little. And there's no filter. That's right. <laughs> my six year old is challenging. Mm. He has a my, my seven. He's gonna be he's gonna be a great leader when he gets older. Right. I keep on telling myself that. There will be payoff. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so, I mean I, I don't know if there's a simple solution for the fatherlessness. But I think there is a mindset, and I think that there is a first step. And it's unique for every man. But they've got to be asking questions. And this has been something I've just been asking the Lord. is like, Lord, what are those questions I need to be asking in order to show up today? In order to not just be there, but actually go in deep and lean into what you have. And I've noticed that those days, those are also the days when I have higher distractions that pull me back into the, well, I can just operate this way and not have to be intentional. And so I have to start assessing and paying attention, like having other people in my life pointing out the blind spots, being like, hey, Chris, you said something and it didn't sound right. And you did this thing and man, and, and I love that feedback that lets me know like, wow, so when they, when I were, I was doing that thing or I said that thing, I was thinking this or feeling that. And they totally received it very differently than how I thought. And so I love that communication. And I think that's, that's one piece is there's gotta be this communication. There's gotta be out there. Like, that's one of the reasons why I've started listening to y'all's podcast after I discovered it through, through Michael Stewart recently. And he's like, man, he's like, start listening to this. And then whenever I, whenever I talk to you, you're like, Hey, go listen to this episode. I was one of those. I was like, I'm going to go back to episode one. And so yeah. I started listening to episode one. And then, and then you were like, dude, listen to some of the more recent stuff. That's, yeah. that's, that's more in alignment with like where we are. And you guys are having necessary conversations that will help men, but we've got to get out of our own way. And we've got to realize that we don't have all the solutions. Yeah. You can't, we can't do it alone. No, not at all. We can't do it alone. And you have to, we have to surround ourselves with, with the other like-minded men that, that have a similar passion, that have a similar mindset knowing that they can be impactful uh, to future generations and we, knowing that we have to make a difference. We have to make a change to make that difference. And like you said, you have to be around other men. They're going to call you out in your BS. Yep. They're going to say to you, Hey man, last month, you said that this was a priority to you. Why haven't you done that? Right. And like love with, with tough love, right? Be, be the man that holds them accountable to their actions, but then also picks them up when they fall, shows them their blind spots. Um, Gives them, you know, an idea that worked for them. Tells them what they failed at and how they learned from it. You can't, you can't get it in a book. I mean, there's great books. Yeah. But you can't get it in a book. You can't get it in an online course. You have to be in community. You have to be um, with, with people that love you, that going to push you to be better one of my closest friends his name's kenyon and he said if you ever have to ask me for permission to ask me a hard question 
we don't have the depth of relationship you think we have. Yeah. It's good. He's like, so if you're curious about how things are between me and my wife, don't ask me to ask me the question. Just say, Hey dude, how are things going with your wife? And we had, uh, we've had, we've had a handful of conversations where it's been going a lot deeper, faster because of that expectation being out there. Like, don't ask me for permission. And one of my other buddies, he, he talks about how he wants men in his life that cover challenge and celebrate you. Mm. And what he means by cover is let's say you're not there and he's in a room and someone's talking about you and they say something is false. Well, they say, Hey, Chris isn't this way. He's actually like this. And then the other part of cover is they're praying for you. And then the challenge part, well, that's pretty straightforward. We've been talking about that, but then the celebrate it's when there's those small moments to the big moments, like they're there to celebrate you, not out of a place of, Hey, I want that too, but genuinely celebrating you like, dude, awesome on closing that deal or love seeing how you and your wife are so well connected right now. And, and just, and so I've been looking intentionally in my life, like, okay, the men that I have in my life, do they cover challenge and celebrate me? Do they help me be a better version of myself? Do they help me ask the questions to the Lord? Am I praying more? Am I, am I trying to kill the flesh so that I can be that servant that God calls us to be the hands and the feet and go low so that the Lord can come through. I'm trying, not always succeeding. It's hard, dude. It's hard. It's yeah. hard. And, and you know what, where does that, what, what, what's the requirement for that? It's, it's vulnerability. Come on, say that again vulnerability Fight. that's something Woo. that we don't do a whole lot of no you you just made everybody turn off <laughs> yeah. you want me to be what say what and honesty vulnerable? vulnerability and honesty those are the two rules that we have inside our men's group you have to be vulnerable and you have to be honest there's a there's a great book um from justin whitmore early called made for people and he, he calls it covenant relationships, covenant friendships. And he references uh, the the relationship that uh, Jonathan and David had in the Bible. They did what you just were talking about. Like, yeah, they had a deep relationship. Deep relationship. They covered each other. Yep. They celebrated each other. They, they celebrated each other. other. They challenged each other. They loved each other. Right. They had a covenant that they would be friends for life. There's not a whole lot of those anymore. No, there's not a whole lot of those. There's, um, Richard Reeves, that same author, he talks that like, we are in a friendship recession, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially men. We don't have, like, if you ask men, like if they have any friends, they're going to say like, yeah, they have buddies at work and, you know, they go out for uh, a beer after work or something like that, but they don't have covenant friendships anymore. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't have covenant friendships. And there's a lot of reasons why. Um, again, there's data and science behind it. Like, you know, mobility, geographic mobility. Men are moving all the time for their jobs. Yeah. And I experienced that in the Navy, in the military. Like, we were moving every three to four years. And you get close with somebody and then you leave and you go somewhere else. And more often than not, you're not going to, like, really stay in touch with them. You're not going to see them anymore. You might talk to them every now and then or see them on Facebook. But those, that's not true friendship men are moving all the time for their career, for their job. Very rarely are they going to move back to like, you know, their best buddy from high school or their close family friend. They're going to go to some new place where they don't know anybody for, for their job. Uh, parenting, like we're parenting way more than we used to. Uh, there's way more helicopter parents. So like if you think about uh, what was the movie, uh, the baseball movie, um, uh, Sandlot. Sandlot. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch Sandlot? Oh man, come on. Some, when the summertime, like the kids would just like leave in the morning leave go and be gone, be gone all day. Man, that doesn't happen anymore. No streetlight right? comes on. I, 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 I was one of those kids. My bike was my freedom. Yeah. I was gone all the time. All the time. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. So, you know, we're spending our times in, you know, as a parent and there's some, there's some greatness to that. 
right? Yeah. I want to be a present parent and be there in the life of my kids. But um, if it's, you know, if you're a helicopter parent and you don't have any time for anything else, that's a problem. And then work, like uh, Richard Reeves calls it workism or careerism. Mm -hmm. Jean-Marc Comer calls it careerism. And uh, if we get so focused on work, that's our identity because that's a lot easier than having a relationship with our children. And then here comes the fatherlessness, right? Like, yeah, you're physically there for dinner, but your brain is on work, on career. And you're not going to go outside and play catch in the backyard after dinner with your kid because you got a work call to jump on or answer some emails. So it's a real problem. It is a real problem. And I, and I think I know that one of the biggest pieces that helped me become a more present parent was actually having boundaries mm -hmm. yep. and being very intentional in my stop and start time and letting my yes be my yes and my no be my no. That's right. And in 2016, I had to close down my business. I had to let go of employees and lost the video production studio and everything and just kept a few freelance clients so that I could actually work from home. And I've worked from home ever since 2016. And I've seen a drastic change in my kids, but also there's the challenge of working from home because you can then work any time. Yeah. And, and so having the hours of the day, now it's not the same Monday through Friday. Like I'll, I communicate with my wife. Okay. Today I'm going to be working later into the night because we've got some deadlines that have to hit for projects. But for the most part, like I try to communicate the start and the stop of the day so that I can actually help make dinner with my wife. Like we tag team dinner. She does prep. I do the cooking. And we work on it together and it knocks it out twice as fast. And then we get the kids involved too. And, and just seeing how that has created, like we sit down for dinner every single night, just about Our, the older kids like Jonah, he's out, he's working, he's got his stuff. He's going back to college again in the fall and he has his schedule, but the nights that he's home, like he's having dinner with the rest of us. And just seeing, and there's no phones at the table either. And I occasionally yeah. will bring my phone to the table and Jamie's like, what is that? <laughs> Call you Sorry. Out. Sorry. We had a podcast guest um, early, early on and he said something that has stuck with me. He said, um, you will always know the priorities by looking at someone's checkbook and their calendar. Absolutely. And so for me, I have, I've had to be really intentional about no kidding, putting things on the calendar. So I, I have, uh, on my calendar, a, a block of time from 5 PM to 7 PM. It's highlighted in red and it says, put the phone down, dude, family time. Good for you. And my kids know it and they're the best at keeping me accountable to it. They'll see me on my phone. And when I'm like, you know, it's time to go throw the baseball in the backyard and my son will be the first to call me out and be like, dad, dad, it's time. Put the, put the phone down, put the phone down, dude. It's, it's, but it's, it's great. Right. You have to put pride. I mean, my work schedule now is pretty much 8.30 AM to 2.45, 3. And that's after I drop the kids off when I drop or pick the kids up, that's my work schedule. And if anyone asks me to do a podcast or a meeting or a phone call after or before those hours, it's, it's just a no, it's a no, it's Good for to, you. Your, to your boundaries. It's, it's not worth it to me anymore. Like I, if you can't take a phone call or a work meeting inside eight 30 to 3 PM, there's a problem there. It means you've got a lot of distractions, a lot of distractions and you haven't prioritized well. That's right. So right. we, we've been kind of on two opposite ends of the spectrum, but also kind of talking about what's in that middle as a dad that's present. So from having a dad or no dad in the house from the fatherless perspective to having a dad that is helicopter parenting and smothering to where we, you and I kind of find ourselves a little bit more is in that like 
intentionality and presence and being there, but not overly being there. What, what would you say is the shift that a man needs that's in that helicopter parent to go into more of just being present, but not smothering? A good exercise for me has been just thinking through what I want my kids to be like when they're a parent. Mm. And there's a, there's a great little line that, uh, that I've kind of used often and I don't know, remember, I don't remember who, who said it, but it says lessons are caught, not taught. So if I can model that for my kids based on what I want my kids to be like when they're adults. I mean, that's our, that's our ultimate job, right? As parents, that's our ultimate job is right. to create good adults. And so if I can model to them what good adulthood looks like, I think that's a really good start uh, for kind of figuring out that balance, right? I want my kids to go, like, I want my kids to see me go have fun with my friends, like mm -hmm. I want them to see me come back from like a mountain biking ride with my buddies. Right? I want them to see me up in the morning reading my Bible first thing in the morning. I want them to see me doing these things. I want them to see me hold the door open for my wife. I want them to see me dance with my wife in the kitchen uh, and do a dance party. Right. I want them to see me, uh, you know, do the things that that you think a good adult should be doing because that's what, they're going to be like when they get older T to my, you know, point of my son listing out me in a nutshell of what he wanted to do from his picture book. It's because he sees me doing these things. Right. Yeah. If I want my kid to be an overly anxious helicopter parent, I guess I should be an overly anxious helicopter parent, but I don't want that. So I shouldn't be that right now. I, I think there's also a, another part in that, caught, not taught, there's a portion of communication that helps them catch it. And mm -hmm. I think one of the most important things with a parent as being a parent is the communication side followed by the take action side and giving the kids the ability to understand where you're taking them. And most cases, letting them at least think that they've got a choice in the matter even if sometimes in that younger age from like zero to eight, they might not have as much active choice and voice in it. But I think giving them an ability to, to feel like they've got some chime in some, some skin in the game on it and collaborate, collaborate with them, but not yeah. let them run shot. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. Um, one, one thing that, uh, we've been trying to implement, we're not, we're not great at it yet, but, um, you know, we'll miss them right now, but we try to do what we call family meetings. Uh, we do them once, Good. once a week, typically on Sundays. Um, and we'll just get together and we'll just talk through, you know, what's going on. Like mm -hmm. we, we talk through our calendar, like what's, what's upcoming for the next week, you know, who's going where, uh, we talk about challenges what what went good for the week what went bad for the week um you know what what do we want to work on um and and then we'll have like special meetings you know we have uh this was this was pretty cool one meeting that we do every year it's typically around the end of the year is uh, we have a family giving meeting and uh my wife and I have a, a donor advised fund that we set up through the National Christian Foundation so we basically tithe uh monthly earnings into the stone advice fund. And so it kind of stacks up throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, uh, as a family, we sit down and we talk about, um, nonprofits that, that are, are exciting to us that, that we would like to support. And I'll tell you what, it's really, really cool to watch a six year old get super excited about giving. Yeah. Right. And like, we get, we get like a, a whiteboard out and we write out different organizations and, 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 uh, you know, different, you know, ways that we can give and support. And, you know, my two kids are like chiming in last year, no kidding. You know, after we kind of like 
stamped stamped down like who we were giving it to and the, the amount of money that we were giving to each organization. My son ran upstairs into his own piggy bank, came back down with like a quarter, a penny, and like two dimes or something like that, right? And he's like, Dad, add this, add this to to our giving. Love it. Like, that's freaking rad, man. Yeah, it is. And so I was thinking, you know, things like that, right? Just just giving them the opportunity to have a say, you know, in in our schedule, in in our uh, you know, we did another one I was talking about earlier, like the the mnemonic for our name, like having conversations around like what is what does Grazier mean to you? What are mm-hmm. what are our family's core values? And and sitting down as a as a family and doing that, having that monthly habitual meeting um, that uh, we can just have conversation, have conversation around the dinner table. You know, like you said, like it's important to have that stuff. I think too many people think that the way that we have family does not exist. Mm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're going to be producing a documentary called mishandled society's attack on dads. And it's, we're going to follow five dads that are actively out there doing what you and I've just been talking about for the last 15 minutes and not just having a conversation, but actually showing their life and what it looks like and how there's actual fulfillment and joy and excitement. But, you know, there's also the challenges, the daily challenges as well. But man, that's, that's like, that's where life happens. It's in that journey part, not in the destination. And that's, I I think that there's got to be a hope and a thing that men can look forward to like, wow, I can still work. I can still do the things that I love to do, but that doesn't mean I have to sacrifice being a husband. Doesn't mean I have to sacrifice being a dad. And I think it's too easy to sacrifice those because those relationships aren't easy. That's right. My relationships with my kids and my wife are some of the hardest and the Mm -hmm. most challenging, but they're also the most fulfilling and life-giving relationships I have. 100%. And I wouldn't trade it, man. Like, no, I would not trade it. There's mornings, there's mornings where I just want to choke slam my six year old. Right. He's he's probably a lot like you, huh? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where he gets it. Probably from his mom. Right. That's your son. That's right. (laughs) That's your son. That's your son when he takes the steak knife out and just starts like trying to cut things on his own and almost cuts his finger off. Well, man, those scars have stories. That's right. That's right. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've uh, just recently, just recently, and and this was, this is based on a book that I read. um, I've really tried to shift my mindset and my focus from uh, very individualistic uh, mm-hmm. point of view to to more of like a team view of of my family it's good and, and i i reference my family as team grazier we're a team right and i wake up in the morning like what's up team what's up team grazier and we do things as a team we we go to sporting events and my daughter watches my son's baseball game as a team my son goes to my daughter's gymnastics competitions because we're rooting as a team. We have family meetings as a team, family goals as a team, family core values as a team. It's not individualistic, right? Like, uh, and, and we get our kids engaged in giving decisions, money decisions, business decisions, travel decisions, calendar decisions. We start doing that at age six and nine. Um, how much better are they going to be when they become an adult and, and are having to make those type of decisions on their own? And then eventually they do it for their own families, right? They'll actually when, when, make a decision. And I, and I think that's, that's right. where the fatherlessness also comes from is the inability to make a, a decision. Mm. It's, it's easier just to survive through the day and only do what's necessary. And that's where you find this place of just existing. And mm. I can't do that. No. Like that, no. 
Uh, you have to live an intentional life. Yeah. That requires work. And, requires and I effort. actually feel like it requires just as much work to be lazy and non-plugged in. And like, there's so much you're missing out on. And that's one of the reasons why we're having the conversations is why I am in this place of like, I know that it can be different for men. And if they don't know, then they don't know. And so creating an awareness and then creating a space for men to go find more. And that's, that's why I'm so happy to have you guys on and to be able to showcase what you guys do through the kinetic man and other people. Cause I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but you guys might be. And so, man, like if, if you guys are tired of listening to handle the daily and you want to go find something else, go listen to the kinetic man. Like, there's stuff there. There's there's somebody out there for everybody. But man, I love seeing the fact that you are not just trying to talk about it, but you're trying to embody it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's it's uh it's very fulfilling. It's very purposeful. It's not easy. Um, but it's very rewarding. It's very worth it. Yeah. It's and, very worth it. And when you got the six and the nine year old knowing what their dad's talking about. They're like, Hey dad, sounds like they'll hold your feet to the fire, man. Well, they will. You got to walk that out too, dad. You can't just talk it, walk it. That's, that's right. Your children, if you allow them to be, are your best accountability partners. Yeah. I, uh, I told my wife after we had recently started handle the daily, I was like, I've got to change some stuff. Like I'm not fully doing the things that I was talking about in that episode, like help me, help me do it better. And I, and I found that she and I've started to have a better conversation about what it is that I need to do, how I need to do it. And it's more of like what you're talking about, creating this team mentality as opposed to the individualistic mentality. Yeah, and that, that comes from a book by Jeremy Pryor called mm -hmm. family family revision he has a you know whole thing called family teams um it's it's a it's a total shift in your mindset but yeah it's it's fantastic it's fantastic i mean that's that's how god wants us to live right right he wants multi-generational families on the same team going to impact the world he doesn't want like onesies onesie twosies you know they don't want individual people trying to go impact the world. He wants teams. He wants families. He wants Abraham and his multiple generations for to come to go and disciple the world. Can't do so that. We, go ahead. You just can't, you can't do that. Like in, in your career that you go and do on your own. So what do you think we need to leave the audience with? on a final thought and a take action. Well, if you're a believer and you believe in the ultimate father, right? We need to show up daily and act more like him. Yep. And if you're not a believer, but you just, want to be a better dad just know that if you are intentional with that there's so much fulfillment in that mm -hmm. way more than a big pay raise way more than a big sale way more than you know sales numbers increasing in your business way more than any success in your business key performance indicators like when your child runs to you and gives you a big hug at the door, when you come home from work, when your son, you know, points up and looks at you on the baseball field, because that's our core value Do that. Like that's, that's deep, true, meaningful, purposeful love. Yeah. And that's so much better. Totally. So much better. I don't know if there's action in that. I mean, the action is just 
understanding and realizing that. And yes, I think to your point, maybe the action is start creating some boundaries. Yes. Start, start creating some boundaries where, you know, I I don't think there is such a thing as a balanced life, but there's an intentional life. There's an intentional life where there's buckets of time and there's a bucket of time that needs to be in place for your work, for your business, for, for that, uh, because we all need to put food on the table, but there is a place and a time and a bucket and you need to put a boundary around it for family time to be present at home, to say no to the 8 PM, you know, work call. Um, so you can go throw the baseball in the backyard with your kid. So I think that's the action step is to put boundaries, make, start creating some boundaries that put your family first. I'm so glad you said what you said, that there's no such thing as a balanced life. It's no. not. And, and I think that too many people are trying to find that. And it is, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I had to put the boundaries in place because I knew that there would be no balance unless I knew what the yes and the no are. And then you find balance between that stop and start and then the stop and start of those buckets, as you were saying. You're hundred percent all in on whatever you have at the time. Give it its all in that moment. And then that way you can give it its all in the next thing. That's right. Yeah. I mean, how frustrating, just think about like how frustrating it is when you're trying to have a conversation with your business partner, with your wife, with your kid. Uh, Well, maybe not your, maybe it's an older kid who has a phone or something like that. And you're trying to have a a direct focus conversation and they're, they're doing this, you know, they're looking at their phone, they're texting and they're just like, "Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm." And they're, they're doing this with their phone. You know, for a fact, they're distracted. They're not even listening to you. Like how, how frustrating is that? It's very frustrating. I mean, that's what we're doing essentially. 100%. That's what we're doing. And that's what we need to stop doing. That's right. So you want to close this out? Yeah, let's do it. Um, dear Lord, help us, help us be more present. Help us be more present mm-hmm. husbands, present fathers. Uh, help us realize that, uh, we can't live a, a balanced life. We need to have a, a focused, intentional life. We need to be a hundred percent all in on you and hundred percent all in on the task at hand, uh, whether that's uh, work, whether that's uh, being a present husband, whether that's being a present father. But more importantly, allow us to be present with you. Allow us for you to speak into us uh, and, and allow us to be more like you as a father. We love you so much. We thank you so much for everything that you provide for us. Allow us to, to spread your message uh, through this platform, uh, to get to more men, uh, to tell them that it is a powerful, powerful thing to be a dad, to be present at home and to win at home to know that's what success is for your kids to know you we love you let me pray amen amen well guys we talked about a lot on this episode yeah we did man but i think i think the biggest takeaway for you is just listen to the episode again no no not really but actually yeah possibly but I think it's it's getting into that place of just starting to ask those questions. Are you one of those three types of dads? And if you're not sure, get some other men around you to help you understand who you are. Ask your wife who she says you are. I think that's, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's. Ask your kids. Ask, ask your kids, your kids how, too. Oh, how you're man. doing as a dad. They'll tell you. Sit down for that one. <laughs> that's right. But men, don't just let yourself be a dad that is physically there, but not there in mind and heart. And just, just know that there's, there is a way to do it better. And you don't have to just survive through the day because your kids need more than that. Your wife needs more than that. And our society is showing the result of men that are not there. So just ask God how you can shift, how you can change and how you can be like, this is something you can start now. And if you don't know how, check out the kineticman.com. 
be part of the conversation, start listening to their podcast, listen to more of our podcast on handle the daily, but guys, there's, there are men out there that are wanting to help you. There is hope. So go lean into that. We'll see you on our next episode. Thank you for tuning into this episode of handle the daily where we conquer the day together so we can build legacy for tomorrow. If you found this episode impactful, share it with other men in your life. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, like, download, and share. To stay up to date in all we are doing, visit our website handlethedaily.com and make sure to tune into our next episode.